Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Sunday drive home. Now, let's get this out of the way. Because you guys are just going to be judgy. I know. Critical. I mean, YouTube invites this sort of criticism. And I know I'm putting myself out there when I put that on YouTube. But you're thinking to yourself, what kind of guy drives around with a snowblower in the back of his truck for three weeks? Well, first of all, it's not just any snowblower. It's Micah's snowblower. And second of all, you're doing the math all wrong. I put the snowblower back there on a Saturday. Saturday, three Sundays ago, which means today is, in fact, only the 15th day that the snowblower has been in the back of the truck. So, I mean, three weeks is too much. But 15 days is fine. It's like way below the threshold of appropriate snowblower hauling. Anyway, today is also Quasimodo Genity. My friend, Pastor Katchemeyer, thinks that the only reason I use the historic one-year lectionary is so that once a year I can talk about Quasimodo Sunday. And he might be right. Quasimodo Genity is Latin for as newborn babes. And remember how, in the, so in the beginning of the traditional liturgical service, like the, one of the very first things that happens is the introit. That's normally a psalm that's chanted or sung or spoken by the people and the pastor and so forth. And uh, there's that psalm that takes up, you have a little verse that comes at the beginning, and then you have a psalm, and then you have the glory be to the Father, and then that verse comes at the end. That's called the antiphon. Well, uh, the old Sunday names came, came from the Latin, from the first phrase of the antiphon of the introit. And so this, this week, the Sunday after Easter, the antiphon comes from 1 Peter 3, as newborn babes, or 1 Peter 2, as newborn babes desire the pure spiritual milk of the word. Probably because... In the old church, they would have confirma- baptisms and confirmations on Easter Sunday. And then the next week, you come back to church and it's encouraging you to, to continue in your study and your joy and your delighting in the Lord's Word. And, and the picture is incredible that Peter gives to us. Like a newborn baby, desire the pure spiritual milk of the Word. Now, how does a baby desire milk? The answer is, they. Cr- I mean, you've seen hungry babies. There's like... There's like uh, what is this Shakespeare line? Hell knows no fury like a wrath of a woman scorned. Is that Shakespeare? Uh, boy, Sunday drive home is classy today. Shakespeare and snowblowers. <laughs> it's probably not Shakespeare. Anyway, that might be true. Hell hath no fury. But but even more, the fury of a child that's hungry. Yee. They just cry. They cry and they won't be... The, ch- the hungry baby is not going to stop crying until you give it the milk. And that's what Peter says we ought to be like. Like newborn babies, desire the pure spiritual milk of the word. So you go to your pastor and you just start crying until he gives, the, until he gives you the milk. <laughs> Uh, sometime when you see me face to face ask me what Luther said about preaching and milk it's probably not good for the YouTubes now the other thing that happens today is we get to hear from John chapter 20 on Jesus appearing to the disciples on Easter Sunday and the week after Easter they're up there they're locked in the upper room and they're afraid for fear of the Jews so they're hiding because they figure well, just like it went with Jesus, that's how it's going to go with them. I mean, they're afraid of, of being tortured and beaten to death and crowned with thorns and, and crucified. But Jesus shows up and he says, peace to you, I give you my peace. And, and, he, and he breathes on him and he gives him the Holy Spirit. And he says, go and forgive the sins of all the people. Whoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven them. It's glorious. Now, we preached about that this morning. So if you're interested in that, I... I would encourage you to uh, maybe someone remind me I'll put the link in a comment or in the I'll try to pin a comment with links I think that's how you're supposed to do it on the YouTubes now that's what they say so someone remind me the sermon link and I'll try to pin it in the first comment um, 
Because it's interesting that Jesus gives them courage and purpose. So they don't want to leave the room because they're afraid. And so Jesus has to give them courage to leave the room and also purpose to leave the room, a reason to leave the room. So he gives them both. And and so to reflect on the on the danger of, of having no purpose in life and stuff, that's all part of it. So I'd, I would, uh, if that's of interest to you, I'd encourage you to go and, and listen to the sermon. Uh, in fact, we, we recount how 10 of the disciples of Jesus were martyred, how that actually happened, so that they're afraid that that's what's going to happen, and they were right to be afraid because they do get martyred. But here's the point is that before Jesus appeared, they were afraid to be martyred, but after Jesus appeared, they were not afraid to be martyred. That's the, that's the thing to think about. But I want to think about Thomas because there's... Ten disciples in the room when Jesus shows up. Judas had hung himself. And Thomas was just out. We don't know where he was. But he wasn't there. And I think this speaks well of Thomas. In other words, the ten, the ten disciples, Peter, James, John, the other 10 minus 3, 7, are hiding in the upper room. They're locked in there. They're there for fear of the Jews. But Thomas was not. He Maybe he was afraid, but he was not so afraid that he had to stay locked up. He was willing to go out and about. Now, we don't know. Maybe he was running errands, going to the grocery store. Someone today told me that they thought he was on a beer run. I actually think that's probably not the case because... Uh, I just don't think they were in a beer drinking mood, these guys. But maybe he was out, and this is maybe more likely, he was out getting news. Maybe Thomas heard that the women went to the tomb and found it empty, and he was going to check it out himself. Maybe they knew, he, Thomas heard that Jesus had appeared briefly to Peter sometime that day, and he was going to try to figure that out. What, where was going back to where Peter was to find if he can find Jesus? In other words, the point is that while the ten are afraid, Thomas is not. Thomas is not afraid to leave the upper room. He's not afraid to die. And this is consistent with what happened with Thomas earlier. Remember when, when they heard they were down in uh, Perea on the other side of the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized and they heard the news that Lazarus had died and Jesus says, let's go up to Bethany. And, and they said, wait, they're trying to kill you in Judea? If you go back up there, they're probably going to kill you. And, and, uh, and Thomas says, let's go. If we die, we die. We're going with Jesus. So that Thomas had this, had this boldness. I mean, Peter said, they might all forsake you, I'll die with you. But Thomas really seemed like he was not afraid of dying, that he had a fearlessness. Now, now with that in mind, think of it. Here Thomas is like, you guys going to come with me? They're like, no, we're too afraid. Come on, guys, let's do it. The tomb is empty. Let's go check it out. No, we're staying here. We're afraid. We don't want to go out. Thomas is like, let's come on, have some courage. Don't you remember the things that Jesus said? Let's go figure out what's going on. No, Thomas, you go by yourself. We're not going with you. So Thomas leaves the ten cowards in the room to go and investigate what's happening. If it's true that Jesus has risen from the dead, if it's true that the tomb is empty, he goes to try to figure this stuff out, and then he comes back, risking his life, trying to avoid being caught by the temple cops and everything like this, doing all this sort of stuff, and then Thomas comes back... And they say, you're not going to believe it, but Jesus was here. I mean, can you just imagine Thomas? Jesus was here with you cowards? I risked my life to go look for him, and he, he can't even wait for me to get back? You guys are hiding. You've locked the door. You're not letting anybody in. And Jesus comes to see you? And not me? I 
I mean, that's got to be a blow to Thomas. Be a blow to any of us. It's like the one person that's doing something that indicates that he still has faith in Jesus. He still believes something of his word. There's one guy who's doing the right thing and he's the one that gets left out? If Jesus was going to appear to any of them, he should have appeared to Thomas, but at least he should have waited until Thomas got back. But no, Jesus appears when Thomas leaves and he disappears before Thomas gets back. Now that is a test. Thomas says, unless I see the holes in his hands and unless I thrust my hand into the side into his side, I will not believe. You wonder how the conversation would go from that point on. I mean, how excited the 10 would be about the resurrection of Jesus and about the receiving of the Holy Spirit and about the gift of the absolution and about the, the being able to have seen the wounds of Jesus in his hands and in his side and how wonderfully joyful they would have been. And then they're telling Thomas and he's like, nope, I don't believe you. And their excitement is now start, it's starting to fade. And maybe they're angry at each other. Now they're just not talking to each other. And this went on for a whole week. They're still there a week later, eight days later, on Sunday afternoon. And, and now all, all 11 of them are there. Judas is still dead. And still Thomas is not believing. You just have to think that the ten are over here talking about the resurrection of Jesus and looking through the scriptures about the resurrection and Thomas is over there by himself, just shaking his head. Well, he thinks they're lying to him. They've got to be, I mean, this kind of mixture of sadness and anger. Thomas, don't you trust us? Aren't we enough? Don't we? And then Jesus comes again, right into the room, and stands right in front of Thomas. And he, he shows him his hands and his side, and he says, put your hands here. Put your hands in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas immediately falls on the ground and says, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus, with kindness, gives him a bit of a rebuke, but a blessing to us. He says, Thomas, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. In other words, blessed are you, blessed am I. We have that faith that comes by hearing and not by sight. The faith that comes in the promise that Christ is risen. Indeed, he's risen. John goes on to write at the end of chapter 20, he says, now these things, there's a lot of other things that Jesus did. I could have written those all down, but there weren't enough room in the world for all the books. But these are written that you might believe and believe and by believing have life in his name. Fantastic stuff. And Thomas now becomes the, the courageous disciple again, the courageous confessor. In fact, tradition says that Thomas uh, traveled to India. You see, and, and here's maybe the point, is that all the disciples ended up being martyred. You know, Peter crucified upside down, Andrew crucified on the X kind of cross, Bartholomew skinned with knives and, and then beheaded. 
but it's Thomas was stoned and then killed with a club. No, as Philip was stoned and then killed with a club. Thomas was, I think, run through by by four guys with spears in India. So that the thing that these guys were afraid of, that wasn't taken away. There was still death waiting for them outside the door, but they had Jesus with them and the promise of the forgiveness of sins and the confidence in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And so they were, they were fearless to go out into the world and preach the gospel. So fantastic. Including Thomas. Including Thomas. Who saw the resurrected Jesus and believed and confessed my Lord and my God. That's just wonderful. I, I, it would have been wonderful too to see the to see the joy that the disciples would have had with each other in their when they finally had that fellowship in confessing the resurrection. I mean, after that's, you know, eight days later and, and Jesus appears to Thomas and Jesus disappears again, and you've got to imagine that, that, the tw- that the ten look at Thomas and Thomas looks at the ten and they're like, see, we told you. And he would say, I'm sorry, brothers, I should have believed you. I just, it's hard. And they would have embraced and gone forth from there to preach in every corner of the world. So the resurrection of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins gives us this courage to leave the upper room, the courage to face whatever kind of dangers out there. It gives us a reason to do the same. God be praised. The Sunday drive home. Get to making with drive for station. When it hits you, yes, 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 you shall. When it hits you, yes, 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 y